All right, today we'll be doing Why I'm Not Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, Part 5, Prima Scriptura and the Early Fathers. In Part 4, I promise to continue on the issue of apostolic succession, so here I want to present several passages uh, from the Early Fathers and beyond which uh, articulate belief in the apostolic authority <clears throat> found in scripture over and above their successors. So it's kind of vicariously dealing with the issue of apostolic succession by showing that the fathers are um, concerned with the authority of uh, the scriptures as, as a sufficient authority. As I've said from the beginning, the issue of authority flows to every other issue to include apostolic succession. So if the scriptures have uh, the authority and teaching of the apostles and the apostles' successors, uh, deviate from those scriptures, then we must side with the apostles instead of the apostles' successors. This is my main argument in this, in this series. And while we may not have tactile ordination tracing back to the apostles, we do have apostolic faith tracing back to the apostles. And this is what I've been uh, emphasizing. Now, this approach doesn't necessarily deny that those in tactile succession have some kind of special charisma uh, given to them some kind of like like a new covenant a resurrected Levitical priesthood or something like this um, but I don't believe that but even if it were true it doesn't mean that they're not subject to the authority of the apostles as found in scripture and so even if it was true we would have to side with the scriptures over and above uh, those in tactile succession. In the next part, I'll deal with the, the specific arguments from Scripture um, about apostolic succession, although uh, there'll be several parts even before that dealing with the uh, just giving a bunch of uh, passages from history of the early fathers that make this way more complex than the narrative uh, that's given by a lot of popular uh, Roman Catholic and um, Eastern apologist. So uh, I'm going to just give a bunch of passages here. I'll give kind of a brief context and I encourage you to read it on, uh, by yourself. I'm not saying that uh, um, I'm not wanting to wrench the fathers out of context. They're, they're complex individuals. They don't all say the same thing. Um, and I'm not trying to say that they, they're a certain kind of Protestant or something like this, but they certainly were not modern Roman Catholics and they weren't modern Eastern Orthodox ca uh, Catholics, I guess you could say. All right, so Irenaeus, second century. We have learned from none other the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. The references are, will be in the, in the blog at the bottom. It seems to me that Irenaeus is saying that the plan of our salvation uh, was learned from the apostles through the scriptures. Notice he says the apostles declared these things publicly, and then later those public proclamations were written down. He doesn't make any mention of some secret oral tradition uh, that was given to the successors of the apostles. He then goes on to describe the scripture as the ground and pillar of faith. It's a strong, using the same language that Paul used about the church, the church in 1 Timothy 3.15. And we'll address that uh, later. But for now, notice the strong language Irenaeus uses in talking about the plan of salvation derived from the apostles through scripture. Going as far as saying the scriptures are the ground and pillar of our faith. It's pretty strong language. Um... Irenaeus, again, he says, Since therefore the entire scriptures, the prophets, and the gospels can be clearly, unambiguously, and harmoniously understood by all, although all do not believe them, and since they proclaim that one only God, to the exclusion of all others, formed all things by his word, whether visible or invisible, heavenly or earthly, in the water or under the earth, as I have shown from the very words of scripture, scripture and since the very system of creation to which we belong testifies by what falls under our notice, that one being made and governs it, those persons will seem truly foolish who blind their eyes to such a clear demonstration and will not behold the light of the announcement made to them. So Irenaeus begins this chapter. He's talking about the ability to interpret scripture comes from a mind devoted to a holy life, to piety, and it's devoted to truth. Set your mind to truth and it commits itself daily to the study of scripture. He then goes on to say that, so he's, he's, 
these are the things that he, I mean, we didn't read this here, but there, even there, he says, this is how you understand scripture. You study it. You live a holy life. You don't have a magisterium that needs to interpret it for you. Um, he then goes on to say that the scriptures are clear, that they are perspicuous. Uh, this is a term that the reformers use, the perspicuity of scripture, that uh, scripture is uh, can be sufficiently understood by the learned and the unlearned alike. You see that in the Westminster Confession uh, 1.7. Um, even though there's uh, difficult parts to understand, it's still understandable with things, it's sufficient for things to salvation. And so Irenaeus may even be uh, overstating his case here a bit, but his point is that scripture is clear, especially on the issue that he's addressing against the Gnostics, that God alone created the heavens and the earth. He goes on to say that this truth is clearly apprehended in scripture and that Jesus did not teach uh, ambiguous, obscure things to a secret group of people that conveyed different meanings of the parables that he taught. So the point being, um, Irenaeus is affirming some form of the perspicuity of Scripture. All right. Let's see here. Let's move on to uh, Cyril of Jerusalem. So this is 4th century. Have thou in mind this seal, which for the present has been lightly touched in my discourse, by way of summary, but shall be stated, should the Lord permit, to the best of my power, with the proof from the scriptures. For concerning the divine and holy mysteries of faith, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the holy scriptures, nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility and artifices of speech. Even to me who tell you these things, give not absolute credence." Uh, unless you receive the proof of the things which I, which I announce from the divine scriptures. From this salvation, which we believe, depends not on ingenu ingenious uh, reasoning, but on demonstrations of the holy scriptures. The larger context here is that Cyril is basing these lectures on uh, Paul's warning to the Colossians, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Incredibly prescient uh, when it comes to uh, the teachings of Rome and the East, which I would put in that category. Uh, and I would say, I mean, it's the same with Protestants. There's Protestants who do this too, um, but I'm, I'm specifically talking about Rome and the East. Uh, he goes on to talk about ten basic doctrines, what you believe, what you should believe about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, and things like this. And then in this particular section, he, he is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he adds this part about the veracity of any statement has to be supplemented uh, by Scripture, including his own, um, that it has to be proved by Scripture, <laughs> and that it must not hang on the ingenious reasoning um, but on, on demonstrations of, of scripture. And this to me is, uh, it's almost this Puritan approach that everything has to be backed by scripture. It certainly is not um, a system of thought which derives its uh, validity of statements from the magisterium, from some kind of tactile ordination. Um, no, it's, it's it has to be grounded in scripture. This, is, this sounds like a Protestant speaking. Okay, so Athanasius, uh, this is also fourth century. Wherefore, the faithful Christian and true disciple of the gospel, having grace to discern spiritual things and having built the house of his faith upon a rock, stands continually firm and secure from their deceits. But the simple person, as I said before, that is not thoroughly grounded in knowledge, such a one, considering only the words that are spoken or not perceiving their meaning, is immediately drawn away by their wiles. Wherefore, it is good and needful for us to pray that we may receive the gift of discerning spirits so that everyone may know, according to the precept of John, whom we ought to reject and whom to receive as friends and of the same faith. Now, one might write at great length concerning these things if one desired to go into details respecting them. For the impiety and perverseness of heresies will appear to be manifold and various and the craft of the deceivers to be very terrible. But since Holy Scripture is of all things most sufficient for us and therefore recommending to those who desire to know more of these matters to read the divine word, I now hasten to set before you that which most claims attention and for the sake of which principally I have written these things. Okay, so what's the broader context? He's talking about the heresies of Marcionism and Manichaeanism. He says, 
that they're wrong because they only accept certain parts of scripture, particularly rejecting the law. But he's like, the New Testament uh, was born out of the law, so you can't separate these things. And he talks extensively about the unity of scripture. He makes mention of the Arians, who are also at odds with the scriptural accounts, and he says that these her heresies all have in common uh, that they're lying, that they're taking only bits and pieces of scripture and not scripture as a whole. He then states what is quoted above, what we quoted. He says, true disciples are given the grace to discern these falsehoods. He then says it's necessary to pray that we receive the gift of discerning spirits. Uh, it's a very charismatic thing to say. I, do, I don't think I've ever heard a reformed person or a Lutheran uh, say, we, we need to ask God for uh, the gift of discerning spirits, something that Paul talks about. Uh, very charismatic thing to say. Furthermore, he adds that we need the ability of discerning spirits so we know who to accept and reject as our friends, channeling uh, John. And what he means by that is that you don't associate with heretics. Then the key statement is said. He says that scripture is sufficient above all for addressing these things. Uh, and that if anyone wants to know more about them, he, um, he suggests that they read the word themselves. It's, it's high commendatory language of the scriptures. He says, you want to know more about these things? Go read it yourself. Um, again, I mean, it's just, he's constantly pointing to scripture. He's not making an appeal to the Bishop of Rome. He's not making an appeal to the authoritative magisterium. He's saying, read the word. All right, Athanasius still. Vainly then do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded counsels for the faith's sakes, for divine scripture is sufficient above all things. Again, the sufficiency of scripture. But if a counsel be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers, for the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter, but stated the doctrine so exactly that persons reading their words honestly cannot but be reminded by them of the religion towards Christ announced in divine scriptures. All right, so the larger context of this... Um, is actually a little bit difficult for me to discern what he's talking about, but it appears he's pushing against some kind of uh, Arianism, and that he says it's not necessary to call a new council because we've already dealt with these things in the Nicene Council, and that they were basically just restating the things that are in Scripture. Uh, and then he says that Scripture is sufficient above all things, in this case, improving the deity of Jesus. Um, so again, sufficiency of Scripture, 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 Scripture. Athanasius again, let it, let this then Christ loving man be our offering to you just for a rudimentary sketch and outline in a short compass of the faith of Christ and of his divine appearing to us word. But you taking occasion by this, if you light upon the text of the scriptures by genuinely applying your mind to them, will learn from them more completely and clearly the exact detail of what we have said. For they were spoken and written by God through men who spoke of God. But we impart what we have learned from inspired teachers who have been conversant with them, who have also become martyrs for the deity of Christ to your zeal for learning in turn. It's from the Incarnation, on the Incarnation, which is an incredible book, really short. But he encourages the man who loves Jesus to read the scriptures for himself, and that by doing this, he will learn more completely and clearly the exact detail of what Athanasius is teaching. And the Roman approach is exactly the opposite. It's don't read the scriptures, read the magisterium, read it through the lens by which we have given you, and then you will understand it more completely and in more detail uh, what the truth is. Athanasius doesn't do that. Athanasius isn't Roman Catholic in that regard. He says, no, just read the scriptures. You want to know more clearly? Read it for yourself, and you can understand it on your own. You devote yourself to it, and you can understand it. Goodness gracious, these men do not sound like Roman Catholic apologists to me. I wanted to say a bit about, um, we'll continue, but something uh, came to mind. C.S. Lewis talks about this in The Four Loves, that the true love of a mother is one which works for the emancipation of her children. And a mother who labor, labors to keep her children continually dependent on her is this weird kind of warped love. It's the selfish kind of love. And that is the sin, whatever that is, I think that's the sin. Uh, it's not just pre prevalent in Rome in the East. This is a sin of just clergy in general. Um, maybe not in general, but a lot of clergy. A lot of clergy uh, and, and Rome in the East want their people... I don't think they're consciously doing this, but they keep their people dependent on mama, on their mother. Now, the church is our mother. Um, she's 
the mother of us all, uh, the Jerusalem from above. But, uh, and, 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 and Jesus gave the church teachers. So we, re, we do rely on all, all these things, but I do think that the teachers were given to the church to facilitate and equip the saints so that we can not rely on them so heavily that there is a certain kind of emancipation by which we eventually come into more direct contact with God where we're able to approach God um, uh, more as grown-ups, that we mature. Um, and uh, I think the whole system of Rome in the East keeps people in perpetual immaturity. Um, but that could be overstating things a bit, but I think that this is prevalent there somewhat. Man, that sun is coming in really, really bright. Okay, Athanasius again. Uh, the knowledge of our religion and the truth of things is independently manifest rather than in need of human teachers. For almost day by day, it asserts itself by facts and manifests itself brighter than the sun, yeah, brighter than the sun, by the doctrine of Christ. Still, as you nevertheless desire to hear about it, Macarius, come let us as we may be able to set forth a few points of the faith of Christ. Able though you are to find it out from the divine oracles, but yet generously desiring to hear from others as well. For although the sacred and inspired scriptures are sufficient to declare the truth, <laughs> while there are other works of our blessed teachers compiled for this purpose, if we meet with which a man will gain some knowledge of the interpretation of the scriptures and be able to learn what he wishes to know still, as we have not at present in our hands the compositions of our teachers, we must communicate in writing to you what we learn from them, the faith, namely, of Christ the Savior, lest any should hold cheap the doctrine taught among us or think faith in Christ unreasonable. So here again, Athanasius is affirming the sufficiency of Scripture, directing people to read Scripture for themselves. He's like, you can find it out for yourself. Um, he goes as far as to say that these things are simply manifested apart from human teachers. And as we said, uh, the, the scriptures themselves affirm that there are teachers given for the benefit of the saints to equip the saints, even though we do learn directly from the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, and high church uh, apologists, whether they're Protestant or not, really like to diminish that aspect that we can learn directly from the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visible church guy. I, I love that we have elders and teachers and, and we learn a lot from them, but we, can't, we can also learn from the Holy Spirit and from reading directly from the scriptures. All right, so um, that's, that's all I have for today. Uh, I'm just going to keep pumping out these quotations because in dialogue with Rome, in dialogue with the East, they're just constantly throwing out this idea that... Uh, that the fathers are theirs, and they're not. The fathers are more complicated than they would have us believe. The fathers, in my opinion, are putting forward Protestant principles here of the supremacy of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture. Um, they don't talk the way that I hear Roman Catholics talking or Eastern Orthodox talking. They talk like my Protestant teachers talk. They talk how I hear evangelicals talk. Um, as far as Scripture goes, of course, uh, the, the fathers are definitely more Catholic uh, in their sacramentology, um, although they're, they're not, you know, they're not Thomist, <laughs> but they certainly have a higher sacramentology of, uh, um, you know, baptism and the Lord's Supper, uh, which evangelicals uh, should believe because that's what the Bible teaches, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, so I just, uh, I'm going to be continuing the series by going through these quotations um, and there's going to be a few dozen of them or so so that'll be where we go next time all right have a good one Bye.